The Beatles' Tomorrow Never Knows, the devastatingly transcendental closing track in one of the most celebrated albums ever, Revolver. As innovative and provocative as it is beautiful, this song is perhaps the most crucial single track the Beatles ever created in order to push the boundaries of what music could be. Today, we're going to show you 10 very interesting facts about the Beatles' Tomorrow Never Knows. Turn off your mind, relax, and float downstream. In 1964, Harvard psychologist Timothy Leary, seen here at John's Give Peace a Chance demonstration, wrote an adaptation of the ancient Tibetan Book of the Dead. Two years later, in 1966, while John and Paul were perusing the inventory at the Indica Bookshop, John stumbles upon the book entitled The Psychedelic Experience. John had initially been searching for a book by Nietzsche, but Dr. Leary's book struck him first. According to Barry Miles, John was delighted by his discovery, sat right there in the shop and began to scan the pages. And lo and behold, on page 14, Dr. Leary's introduction reads, whenever in doubt, turn off your mind, relax, float downstream. This of course directly contributing to Tomorrow Never Knows opening lyrics. Dr. Leary's book was also written as a tool to guide people who chose to go on LSD trips. And unlike Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, John Philly admits this song has all the trappings of recreational drug use. He says, Leary was the one going around saying, take it, take it, take it. And we just followed his instructions in his How to Take a Trip book. I did it just like he said in the book. And then I wrote, Tomorrow Never Knows, which was almost the first acid song. Lay down all thought, surrender to the void, and all that shit which Leary had pinched from the Book of the Dead. John reportedly took LSD while on a plane to the beautiful country of Trinidad and Tobago in 1966. Side note, if you were wondering, that's where I'm from. And while tripping and reading Dr. Leary's book, John recorded himself as he drifted away into his psychedelic experience, thus inspiring him to try and capture an LSD experience in a song. Originally, Tomorrow Never Knows was supposed to be entitled The Void. In Buddhism, the void, also known as sunyata, is often referred to where one goes in a truly meditative state, emptiness or the non-self, even potentially ego death. However, to cushion the heavy philosophical lyrics, John decided to use one of Ringo's malapropisms as the title. Ringo says, I used to, while I was saying one thing, have another thing come into my brain and move down fast. Tomorrow Never Knows was something I said. God knows where it came from. John used to like them most. He always used to write them down. I seem to be better now. You can hear Ringo say that fateful line right here. You can't blame you know, what can you say? What can you say? Oh, yeah, Tomorrow Never Knows. Of all the Beatles, George Harrison is the one best known for his interest in Eastern philosophy and spiritualism. However, even though he praised the song for its very sincere approach to expressing meditation lyrically, George expressed reservation towards the idea that John knew exactly what he was talking about. George says, The whole point is that we are the song. The self is coming from a state of pure awareness, from the state of being. All the rest that comes about in the outward manifestation of the physical world, including all the fluctuations which end up as thoughts and actions, is just clutter. True nature of each soul is pure consciousness. So the song is really about transcending and about the quality of the transcendent. I am not too sure if John actually fully understood what he was saying. He knew he was onto something when he saw those words and turned them into a song. But to have experienced what the lyrics in that song are actually about? I don't know if he fully understood it. After a long break from the Beatles, John joins the band at Brian Epstein's house at 24 Chapel Street in Belgravia. John retrieves his guitar and begins to showcase Tomorrow Never Knows for the first time. Paul McCartney recalls this event saying, John got his guitar out and started doing Tomorrow Never Knows, and it was all one chord. This was because of our interest in Indian music. We would sit around at the end of an Indian album, we'd go, did anyone realize they didn't change chords? It would be like, shit, it was all E. Wow, man, that's pretty far out. So we began to sponge up a few of those nice ideas. That droning quality is iconically Indian as traditionally it doesn't modulate like Western music, but rather stay in one key and create a certain wall of sympathetic sound. However, George Harrison does mention that although it is one chord mainly, there is an overdubbed secondary chord on top of the song, giving it more color. He says, there is a chord that is superimposed on top of that that does not change. If it was C, then it changes down to B flat. That was like an overdub, but the basic sound all hangs on the one drone. 
The Beatles were always pushing the boundaries of what music could be. That's why so many of us revere them as the innovators they were. And Ringo's drums were no exception. His tom-tom skins were slackened, and the recording was given a heavy compression and echoed effects to create this uproarious, thundering pattern. Recording engineer Jeff Emmerich recalls the process, stating, I moved the bass drum microphone much closer to the drum than had been done before. There's an early picture of the Beatles wearing a woolen jumper with four necks. I stuffed that inside the drum to deaden the sound. Then we put the sound through a Fairchild 660 valve limiters and compressors. It became the sound of Revolver and Pepper, really. Drums had never been heard like that before. This is one of my favorite music facts, because if they ever decided to make a Beatles movie again, this sequence would be gold. Each Beatles was given a sort of homework to create tape loops of random sounds, many of which can be heard on the record. George Harrison recalls saying, Everybody went home and made a spool, a loop. Okay class, now I want you all to go home and come back in the morning with your own loop. We were touching on the Stockhausen kind of avant-garde clue music. Paul, who was initially into tape loops, stated that he would collect sounds like seagulls, laughter, swaying of places, vehicles, and even just the sound of the mountains. On the 7th of April, 1966, they all converged into the studio to overdub their tape loops. There was so much tape that they were using pencils and glasses to make them operate correctly, including having six men literally holding the tapes in loop with pencils, all for these incredibly unusual sounds that would make the record something otherworldly. Usually John's vocals were artificially double-tracked once the tech became available, but for this song he decided to manually do it for the first half, even though he despised doing that. He really wanted to make these vocals shine in their own way, even to the point of asking George Martin if he could make his voice sound like the Dalai Lama chanting from a hilltop, to which George replied, It's a bit expensive, can we make you do it here? So they ran John's voice through a Leslie speaker. George continues, By putting his voice through that, and then recording it again, you got a kind of intermittent vibrato effect, which is what we hear on Tomorrow Never Knows. I don't think anyone had done that before. It was quite a revolutionary track for Revolver. Sadly, as John looks back on the song, he has said it felt short of what he envisioned, saying, With Tomorrow Never Knows, I imagined in my head that in the background you would hear thousands of monks chanting. That was impractical, of course, and we did something different. I should have tried to get near my original idea, the monk singing. I realize now that is what it needed. Maybe if I ever do a cover of the song, I'll hire some monks and see what it sounds like, just for John. Now, this is a fact that I think we're gonna have some fun with in the comments. Make sure you leave your opinion, because in this case, it's kind of like a vote. When the guitar solo in Tomorrow Never Knows is reversed, it sounds like this. Sounds kind of familiar, right? Well, Taxman Solo, the opening track of the very same album, Revolver, sounds like this. Pretty close, but not identical. Now, Paul actually played that solo on Taxman, and it has his unique vibe to it, but the key and timing, and even the feeling of the solo for Tomorrow Never Knows is different, but it's the same structure. So knowing what we know about the Beatles, what do you think is the case? Did they chop up the Taxman solo, alter its pitch, mix it as best as they could, and drop it in reverse? Or did they simply record it another time for the song? I'm really curious what you all think because there's no definitive information on it as of now. Well, that's all for today, everyone. Such a great song and such a fun story to tell. Make sure to check us out on Instagram, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next week. But of course, tomorrow never knows.